So I'm going to start by saying a little birdie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> has has um, told me you have a lovely voice. And also, actually, as well as that little birdie, my partner, Rachel, or now fiancé, is... Um, Congratulations. <laughs> fiancé. Is, um, went to the workshop with Jenny Keane and she was there for your singing as well so we are gonna ah, we are gonna talk okay. about singing and you got your guitar i think i know who the birdie is <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly um so now we are gonna um do, have a little sing song i say we i don't know what i'm gonna do <laughs> you can try <laughs> if you want to. um what i am interested in talking to about is um and i always struggle with this pronunciation eye of the data uh, are the, <laughs> Ayur, Ayurveda, sorry, Ayurveda. Yeah. And I, I've actually had an Arve, Ayurveda uh, treatment okay. before when I was in India, um, which was like a massage. Mm. But, and it was fairly interesting, a lot of oil. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I, I mean, it w- wasn't what I expected, but I'm not even sure what I expected. I did it because I was familiar with the word, familiar with the, the practice as it being like a complete... Well, you can tell me more it's about, but being it being about health and kind of uh, an alternative to Western medicine, and um, that was just to give me a little taster. But if you were to put it in layman's terms, what is Ayurveda? Okay, How so it's um, essentially it's a it's a holistic health system um, which originated in India, um, but it deals with elements of um, the physical body. Uh, the emotional body mental health and spiritualities as well so it really it actually um originated within the context of yoga so if we look back at you know these um the basically the the seven stages of hatha yoga the first two are purification and strengthening and so that in our in our minds would generally you know make us think of the body so you're purifying you're, you're you know you're eating clean you're doing eating fresh organic kind of foods which in those days would have been all they had because they grew their own food. You know, everything was very, very, you know, natural and fresh. Um, and then strengthening in terms of the physical body. So you're getting the body strong and healthy um, so that it can be that, you know, that container so that you can then start to look within and like focusing on the more meditative side of things. So it really, it, what it did in, 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 its, in its original kind of form was it really prepared the body to practice yoga. Um, and even in one of the first um, sutras, um, Patanjali sutras, it says, you know, um, having prepared the body and, you know, and then it goes on to now we practice yoga. So one of the first ones is, OK, you've already done this. So it's a kind of expecting that you've already addressed these term, these kind of aspects of getting the body strong and healthy through this kind of proper diet for your constitution, kind of proper different practices that are going to work for your your constitution Um and yeah, so it's kind of assuming that that has been done already before you embark on the, the path of studying yoga or practicing yoga in, in the way that, you know, that it was practiced then. So the strengthening part I'm familiar with, the mm. purification part or the cleansing part, what does that entail? Yeah, so essentially when, whenever, you know, if somebody would come to you um, with a specific ailment or, you know, dis- or dis- disease, I suppose, um, we see that as an imbalance in Ayurveda. So any any disease or whatever it is, whether it's dry skin or like an internal more in, like digestive issue or something, that is seen as uh, as an imbalance. And so the purification really just means that it kind of gets you back into balance. So obviously at the beginning, if it's somebody who's a very kind of a toxic lifestyle, who's eating and drinking all sorts of different things, they will take a little bit longer to move towards that kind of clean more balanced state in their body whereas if it's someone who's already quite conscious of what they eat and who's quite um you know healthy in general then that means they're going to have less of a less of a hard time if they if they decide to do some sort of cleanse or something Mm. um but generally with it with ayurveda cleanses they can last depending on what you need so it again it's very individual which is something that i love as well because a lot of modern western medicine kind of looks at okay this is what you take for that grand you know just just take it and you'll be fine whereas they don't take the individual constitution into account um so everyone has different needs everyone has a different um doshic type um which i'll talk about in a minute but yeah so 
basically it's look it's a bio individual kind of approach to it you know so I also studied um, integrative nutrition with um, a, a health coaching school and that was more more modern kind of stuff you know more just like diet and um, you got all the basic nutritional information that you'd expect from something like that but it also had an aspect of Ayurveda in it as well um, and then I'm I've also, I've also studied Ayurveda with with the teacher of mine from Byron Bay as well through the through the lens of tantric hatha yoga so it really blends in all these different things um and so to answer your question um <laughs> i think you did answer my question did i okay, yeah i mean I'm kind of the main no no the main thing i got <laughs> from that is that well, for a start it's very individualized mm. it's it thinks about people's um their, the energy that they have, which I think you said they call the doshas, doshic type, doshic dosha type. or dosha, or whatever yeah. you want to say, doshic types, and and how, and I think there is a place for Western medicine to some degree, oh, definitely, but how yeah. we we should be treated as individuals, and also does it take into account our environment? So yes, the climate we're in, yeah, hugely. That's a right. huge, huge factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the food we eat, does that? What does that look like if you were to say prescribe someone? Okay, let's say for example, right? Me and you, we're doing a a one to one. Mm -hmm. You're coaching me, yeah. You're doing one you like a, a mock session. What would you need to find out about me to understand what I would need? Okay, so um, there's uh, there's a big long like a very long questionnaire that you'd get, um, asking different aspects of your, um, you know your. I mean, to get an idea, first of all, of your current routine would be important. Right, okay. Um, to get an idea of your your height, your um, weight, your tendencies in terms of your emotional tendencies. So mm. what do you um, tend to lean towards in times of imbalance? You know, when you feel imbalanced, what does that look like for you? For some people, it might be getting angry and agitated and very easily uh, um, irritated. For others, it might be getting anxious and flighty. Mm -hmm. Um, and for others, when they're imbalanced, they'll, they'll feel like it's um, it's a very heavy, almost depressive kind of lethargic kind of uh, a thing that comes on. So this is indicative of your your type of your your constitution, basically. So the vata, pitta and kapha. Mm -hmm. um, and that. you can have any combination of the three as well. And the important thing to know is that we all have all three. So it's kind of similar to the yin and yang comp co um concept in that you know we all have yin and we all have yang similarly we all have vata we all have pitta we all have kapha qualities um, and depending on things like our lifestyle so what we eat on a daily basis um our diet that's what i said our dietary habits um our environment that the environment we live in our um, emotional stability um and also our spiritual practices or our movement practices also hugely impact um what how imbalanced or out of balanced you are mm. um and so yeah so if you were to come along let's say and you were someone who's quite um kind of stocky built you know like good muscle tone like very very <laughs> <laughs> very um very active very you know um motivated and driven and goal orientated you know really likes to get shit done that kind of person um that would be more of a pitta quality in terms of um your your emotional tendencies you know so that that would be kind of um indicative of of a pitta dominant type um when it's balanced like i said pitta can be can be driven can be motivated can be very very good at like um getting tasks ticked off the list and really just going for things without overthinking them mm. But the obvious flip side to that is, you know, when you when you work too hard and you kind of end up burning yourself out because you're just constantly burning, 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 burning. Um, and I talk to this a lot in the in the workshops that I've been doing, the Ayurveda intro workshops. Um, you know, when you think about pitta, so it's the elements of fire and water um, combined. And so I should have started off explaining that, that it's all based around the, the, the concept of the elements in mm -hmm. nature. Um, and so vata is a combination of air and ether, hmm. pitta is a combination of fire and water, and kapha is earth and water. And so it's really saying, you know, which elements are dominant in your constitution. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on what's dominant, you know, it could be out of balance. And if it's out of balance, then you, you look at what you can do to bring it back to balance. Mm -hmm. And if it's, if it's like under, if it's underactive or if there's not a lot of it there, obviously you, you look at what you can do to bring it back to 
that state. So again, it's kind of similar to the concept of yin and yang yeah. in, in a more kind of complex way. Um, but what I loved about it was that it really, it brings in this kind of con- idea that we are not separate from nature as as beings, as humans. Um, and that, you know, to look at dietary stuff is just one factor. Um, and that's what I always try to stress and to make the point of is that, you know, it's it's, yes, it is important what we eat and mm-hmm. how to to kind of know what to eat to balance ourselves you know to to uh, to be our most balanced kind of selves but because there's so many other factors to it um i feel like especially now that people are starting to know about it a little bit more in the west it's very easy that we get strayed down that oh it's a diet you know ayurvedic diet it's like yes it is a big part of it and it's an important part but there are so many other moving parts to it too Mm. and so what i said at the start about it being um initially you know conceived of basically so that people could have these healthy stronger bodies so that they could pursue yoga so that they could meditate for longer so that they could have stronger bodies healthier bodies to pursue that goal of fulfilling their dharma and realizing their dharma and going to towards that as a, as a goal rather than i want to be fit and i want to look like this you know mm. and i want to i want to be like I don't know, you know what I mean? Yeah. With this kind of fascination that we have whenever the word diet comes into things, I'm just quite passionate about making a point of like that it's not just about that, you know? So it is an important part, um, but it's not the only thing. And so there are Mm. even specific yoga practices that you can do to to alleviate imbalances and to, to bring you back in. So, you know, for a vata person who's very anxious, there's certain practices that are not gonna benefit that. And there's certain practices that will. Similarly, if they're kapha and they're feeling quite heavy or low or sluggish, certain things are going to help with that and certain things aren't. And I'm talking in terms of yoga practices, styles of yoga, um, different meditation practices even can can really impact that. So it's diet Mm -hmm. is one part. Yeah. Um, Emotional stability, you say. What were the two other parts? Um, So... Everything really, environment. Everything, environment, yeah. Um, mental health, envi- uh, emotional health, spirit, spiritual practices. When you say emotional stability, mm. what what would you say are telltale signs that someone doesn't it is it needs that like it, it is it is emotionally unstable? Yeah. So I mean, it can look differently in 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 each constitution. So maybe I'll go what it would look like in each one yeah sure yeah so for a vata person being are probably the most unstable because vata is the air and the ether element and that's quite light and the qualities of vata are light and dry and mobile and cold and fast moving okay so any kind of um tendency to overthink and be up in the mind and leading to anxiety and all these things it's an excess of vata and it's an excess of the air element in the mind and so emotionally that would be quite anxious and quite um scatty and like just you know not being able to sit still and kind of being you know feeling one thing one minute and completely switching the next and just being like oh okay cool i'll do this and it's funny because like we all have moments like that and we all have experienced well maybe not everyone but i definitely do I have a lot of Vata in my constitution, so I that's why I feel, you know, I know that one quite well as well as Pitta. But um but emotionally as well, it's it's um you know, just being quite uh unpredictable. You know, so it's kinda like working with a moving target when you're trying to pacify Vata and get it to, to ground itself. It's like it's very difficult because it's it's definitely the, the one that goes out of balance the most in people. Um, and especially in the West with our kind of lifestyle that we have, it's just go, 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 go. And a lot of stimulation, overstimulation of screens and that can really impact Vata. Mm. Um, and then Pitta emotionally, like I said, can be angry or ir- irritable, like quite easily aggravated yeah. um, and judgmental. You know, they can be very quick to judge people and you know, judge themselves as well. Um, and then, but also with the fiery nature of pitta it can be quite passionate and intense Mm -hmm. and so that can obviously go either way that could be you know passionately in love or passionately angry you know (laughs) so it's this intensity almost that that pittas have um and that can be out of balance when it's overly you know overly angry or overly obsessive almost about something Mm. um and so that's where the pitta kind of would come in um, and kaphas are actually emotionally quite stable in themselves because um 
the earth and the water element are, are very grounding. And so when a kapha is balanced, they're definitely the most stable um, emotionally. They're very, very nurturing. Um, and they have this kind of, you know, solid quality to them in that, you know, this person that you can just rely on and depend on and come to for, you know, for <clears throat> for problems that, and they're not going to lash out at you or try to make you think differently. You know, it's mm. kind of this kind of idea of, okay, well, they're generally quite slow spoken and they, they pace themselves. And so emotionally, that means they would be very almost clear or almost like just... Yeah, just more stable in, mm. in their emotional state. But that being said, we have to look at the flip side for everything. So when a kapha is out of balance, they can easily lean towards that kind of depression side of things, which is just the heaviness of not feeling anything at all. Um, and so I suppose, like I said, we've all probably experienced each of those to some degree. Mm. Uh, and, and everyone has. And that that's, that's kind of um, why it's important to know that, you know, you're not just one or the other, even if you're told or you do any of these quizzes and it's like oh you're a vata pitta um and you think oh i have no kapha at all it's like yes you do you have you still have kapha but it's just probably in a lesser amount Mm. um and so yeah it's just it's it's just kind of this constant fluctuating thing um which changes depending on you know what we've taken into our body what's around our body what environment we're in the kinds of things we're exposing ourselves to you know stimulating our minds with as well Mm. um and when you say stimulate our minds with, do mm. you mean well, like screens or okay. even even like the the movies you're watching or like the things you're taking in? You know, that's if there's a lot of violence in that. You know, that's gonna come into to that's you're you're taking that in essentially, and it's it's an intensity, um, that can mm. well I believe anyway that that can really impact the the way that you see the world as well. You know, mm. so we just have to be really mindful, I think, of what we're taking in and the people, the conversations we're engaging in, and I'm sure I don't have to tell you that. <laughs> Yeah, and what's sad for me is the amount that the masses can be controlled by media, mm. whatever's in the media. Yeah. And we've all thought, we've all experienced that ourselves sometimes, depending on what mental state we're in. You take everything as gospel and you want to kind of, um, you know, feel like you're fighting for something. Yeah. But it's... Um, I mean, I've I've had I've completely rethought social media mm. in the last just few weeks, actually, because maybe some people don't realise. I'm sure they do, but uh, thinking about being a yoga teacher, it's like it's it's like any self-employed occupation. You you get out what you put in, yeah. and you spend a lot of time. Often, maybe not, maybe not if you live in Bali, but if you spend <laughs> a lot of time indoors for a start. You actually don't get to be out that much if you're going from studio to studio. Also, you realise how powerful your phone can be to mm-hmm. help you promote. The downside of that is what's your balance? What I've decided to do consciously now, and, and I've mentioned this before, but just um, but is when I go on my phone, what am I doing? Yeah. What's my actual time? Uh, what's, um, so my my home screen now doesn't have any social media on it. It's actually v- very well organized, my home screen. It's all like productivity or creative tools um, or for writing mm. or for reading. That's it, essentially. Yeah. And um, when I'm on my social media, my p- plan is to create, not consume. I, I, I you, f- you fall into it sometimes fine as I'm scrolling, but to be conscious of that yeah. and to um to understand that I, I as a yoga teacher lately i kind of feel like a bit of a hypocrite because my i've been out of balance mm. i've been getting so um caught up in things that are going on around me and things i should or shouldn't be doing instead of listening to myself and as i mentioned to you in the car coming up here and this sounds weird i know maybe a bit <laughs> e- egotistical but I spend a lot of time on YouTube watching mindset videos and coaching about uh, teaching communication. And this all interests me, this field. But lately I've started watching some of my own videos. And like <laughs> what I, instead of realizing sometimes I ha- I know more than I give myself credit for, mm-hmm. instead of always looking for someone else to see what do they think and does my thoughts align with them? And instead to, and I think that's the value of either podcasting, blogging, maybe songwriting, Mm. is to what's actually happening in your head and to understand we have a wisdom within us uh and it's 
I think very important that we don't get misled too easily and yeah. and otherwise you're living in a reactive state constantly yeah. what's because you weren't too hot on uh, instagram and social media uh, a couple of years ago but obviously you now are what's your relationship with it um well i mean i've always had all the, the kind of social platforms and stuff and um i mean i don't know i i feel like with the yoga industry as it is I, I hate even using the word industry but it kind of that's what you kind of have to speak of it about uh, or yeah um well currently I kind of use it mostly just to promote different things that I'm doing and mm. um when I was traveling that was the first time it really kind of became something that I was like oh because I actually felt like I had nice pictures to share you know that kind of yeah. way so that was how it kind of I suppose <laughs> yeah that's kind of how it started because I was away and I was like oh you know keeping in touch with people and I have nice pictures and that kind of spurred me to share a bit more and I was learning a lot about yoga at that point so it kind of became just what I was experiencing I shared or like and I've always been a writer you know I studied English in college so I, I really love the the way that you can um create I, I find it quite a creative outlet because you can mm. create in the way you take the picture you can create in what you write yeah. and yeah I just love the creativity of it really mm -hmm. that's that's like what I like about it and you know I've I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I studied English and I very was considering just doing writing at one point, you know, doing copywriting and that. So um, for me, it's a way to share that and it's a way to, to share my own experiences using that um, mm. and using that ability, I suppose, as well. Um, but you do have to be very, very wary of what you're consuming and, you know, unfollowing things that don't make you feel. I mean, that's kind of a, an, an obvious kind of a thing, but I feel maybe sometimes it's good for the reminder just to say, you know, if you see something and you read something and it's not really what you want to be showing up on your feed, just don't follow it. Mm -hmm. um, and in that way, then you can you can curate your own kind of feed. You know, you can really create like if I want to be seeing inspiring yoga posts all the time, that's pretty much all I see now, because that's yeah. that's kind of what I, I want to see. And that's mm -hmm. what I want to, to invite in. Um, and what you were saying there about, you know, looking at your your past um videos that you've put up and like looking at them and trying not to judge yourself and that kind of thing i feel like you know whenever we put something on the internet um and i've experienced this with for years because i was involved with a youtube channel that you know created a lot of videos of Skylga and shared them online and there was always this kind of concern about what people would think um and i really at the beginning of all of that, I got very, very wrapped up in that. Um, and if it was a video that I had been heavily involved in or that my face was in especially, I was always like, oh my God, what are people saying? Look at the comments, what this? And it, it made me, it, I, I, I experienced both sides of it because I experienced the kind of intensity of something doing extremely well on the internet and the feedback that you get from that and the feelings that come from that. And also the experience of something maybe not doing so well and me being wrapped up in my head going, what could I have done better? Blah, blah, blah. And you, you start the whole self-negative talk starts. So I feel like just from experiencing both sides of it and then starting to really put my own content out there, um, whether it was writing or singing or whatever, um, I just kind of got back to the point of why I, w like why I wanted to share, but also what I was sharing. And it, in a way it helped me to clarify what I actually wanted to share, if mm. that makes sense. Because yeah. I did take the time and I, I, I do still try to take the time of like, what's my intention with sharing this and why, what's my intent? Like, what do I want to get? What, what do I want people to get from this? And I've always said, um, like I, I taught a workshop on one of the YTTs in the yoga hub recently. Well, a couple of weeks, months ago. <laughs> and, um, one of the points I made, which is what I was trying to say earlier was that, um, you know, if you if you're a teacher of any kind, it doesn't have to be yoga, and you have a group of people in front of you, um, and you have a topic to deliver or a subject or a class or whatever it is, you are only going to meet those people where they're at. You know, so there's a certain amount that you can control in that you can control how you present it, how much you've prepared, all of these kind of things. But once it gets past that point you can't control their reaction. You can't control how ready or not they are to hear it, to receive it. You can't control how much they get from it, if they love it or hate it or, or just go meh, whatever. Um, 
and so there's a there is that element i know even when i started teaching yoga i was very like oh my god what did people think you know <laughs> and if people didn't say thank you i was like oh you know <laughs> and i was like why didn't they thank me and literally those thoughts go in your head and then someone says thank you and you're like oh thanks you know and it's just and like i'm always ashamed to say that but it's true and i feel like everyone like a lot of teachers can relate to that and you know it's it's this kind of idea of coming back to ayurveda and the doshic types right so every class that you teach is not going to be good for everybody in that room and even just looking at you know if it's a class of 30 people and you have different doshic types all different like vatas pittas kaphas kif pa, kif oh my god <laughs> pitta kaphas and vata kaphas and all these different combinations i just talked about ayurveda earlier so sorry <laughs> yeah but no i just got tongue-tied but um so basically, yeah, you could have all these different people with all these different needs and different imbalances and you, they're all doing the one yoga flow. Um, so half those people are going to leave imbalanced. Mm. You know, that's just that's just the, with public classes. That is why it's only going to go so far. And that's why I work one on one. And that's why I much prefer to do the personal kind of things of like, what's this person's imbalances and needs? And, you know, how can I address this and what practice can I give them? And so that's what I'm doing with the one-on-one -on -one work is that we do a, a, co a coaching session, just chatting and then giving the, that person a yoga practice that that will work, you know, d depending on what their needs are. Um, and so coming back to the, the goal, let's say, if there is a goal of cultivating stability and cultivating steadiness emotionally, physically, mentally. And when you have those three things in, in alignment and in balance, that's when that person is going to start saying, oh, OK, you know, I don't have to be buzzing all over the place trying to get work done and trying to prove myself and trying to post online and that, like those things will help if you're trying to grow a business or do whatever. But if you can find that stability within you and the more and more you come back to that through practice, through the diet that's going to suit that, through the environment that's going to suit that, it's um, it's really empowering. And so I really try to impart that on people when I when I chat to them. It's like, it's not about getting fit and getting the perfect yoga body and all this kind of stuff. It's it's really about you know empowerment and realizing that you do have the power to, to kind of go about your life in a way that is going to benefit you and you can take back that power if you don't feel like it's there at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I know a lot of people will kind of come and be like, oh, I can't stop drinking coffee or I eat this all the time or I have f takeaways and stuff and I, I love them and I'm really attached to them. And and it's like, okay, that's 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 a step, you know, because that's kind of maybe the first thing that, that I would look at and say, okay, maybe we can just reduce that. Um, I don't like ever telling anyone not to ever eat something because I feel like that's too restrictive. Um, and I feel a lot of people can get very scared off by that and it just puts people off because it's like, no, I can't have this, uh, you know, and it gives it brings about a negative kind of a, a connotation to it. So the, the, the recommendation is really just to slowly reduce something and gradually, you know, the more you increase the good stuff and you, you kind of crowd out the, the stuff that's not helpful mm. um, for the body. And again, it's about tuning in to, to your body and your needs and not thinking, Oh, but everyone else is having this. I should have it anyway, and have and cultivating the strength to to say actually no, that's not going to serve me right now. That's going to lead me to be really bloated or out of balance or anxious or whatever it is. You know, if it's alcohol or coffee, most people like most people actually don't need them because especially women, you know. And I'm sure Jenny Keane has spoken to this as well. Don't need what? Most women. Coffee stimulants. Most women don't need coffee. Uh -uh. Fellas, mm, I mean. If, if anyone can have it. But it's just to be, again, it's, it's just to be wary of what it does to you. And what does it do? What, it's just the stimulating effect on the nervous system and how that goes into the, the mind. And it can really just send you, for anyone who's ever experienced anxiety or anything like that, it's really, it's really not a good thing to be, to be having. But again, I don't want to say don't have this or, you know, it's, it's really just about experimenting. Um, and so a lot of Ayurveda is giving people recommendations um, telling them and empowering them to to experiment with these recommendations, see how they feel and get really, really honest with how they feel when they, let's say, have one thing or another yeah. um, and when they practice in one way or another. When I... You brought up some interest in there about mm. telling people it's not good to tell people this, they should or shouldn't do this. Mm. Um, when I did my 
300 hour teacher training the conversation of diet came up mm. and the two trainers who are very well known uh, very well respected in the yoga world said that they're not vegans they're not actually vegetarians either and a couple of people were irate mm. they were really upset i mean and it was it really derailed the training because it became it was a fundamentalist attitude of well how can you call yourself xyz if you mm. don't do xyz and i thought to myself this is this is strange because um and I don't want to make a judgment on people either, but I thought this doesn't seem very yogic. Mm. You're telling someone they have to live a certain way, otherwise they can't share yoga. Um, but maybe you shouting down them and trying and judging them completely, um, you, you could do with examining yourself. I think what's a much healthier way um, for people to reconsider their actions is to make suggestions yeah. to say. These you can do this or do this. These are the pros and cons of both. But you're an individual, exactly, and you make the decisions instead of uh, telling people. Yeah, exactly, and that comes back to to tantra really, and that empowerment that we're really trying to master our own energy with the word tantra. It's the science of energy management, mm. and so it's like oh, noticing okay. what certain things do to your energy, and being able to make those decisions to say actually no i'm not, i'm going to practice this today or i'm going to have this today instead because i know that that leads to me feeling more empowered and more balanced and mm. so yeah it, for me it comes back to empowerment every time and it comes back to the feeling of of like autonomy and being able to make those decisions for yourself and mm. coming back to a state of trusting yourself so that then your body can start to trust you so you know it's going to one thing with Ayurveda is that, you know, regular routine is, is really helpful um, when it comes to meal times and things like that and having a proper amount of sleep, food, sleep and sex are the three pillars of Ayurveda. Um, yeah, so it's kind of like having having those three in, in, in balance and in order and in... in this not at the same time, though. No, ideally would, not. That wouldn't work. <laughs> Get up, though. No, that wouldn't work at all. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's kind Sorry, of... Sorry, I was being childish there. No, it's funny. Um, yeah, having having those those three pillars kind of in, in a stable place, you know, and you'll, you'll hear a lot of people, especially in the tantric yoga world, talking about brahmacharya and this kind of celibacy almost. It's one of the yamas and niyamas of like, don't have sex, you know, basically. And that really puts people off. It's like, what? I can't I can't do yoga and have sex? Like, that's what? Um, but again, it comes back to this idea of energy management, of the correct and wise use of your sexual energy, yeah. of knowing how much you have, when to give it, when not to give it, and to just be wary of that. And with that awareness comes empowerment because then you're taking back that power. You're saying, actually, this is not going to be the best thing for me right now. Mm. Or maybe this time I can, you know, and that's what it's talking about. It's not about don't do it or you'll die. It's like Mean Girls. It's like don't have sex or you'll die. <laughs> <laughs> you get pregnant and die. Like, should give that to Leo Bradker. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's again, it's just coming back to empowerment, and, and Ayurveda is just one tool that helps us in that that process of you know c taking back the the awareness of your body, of your physical body through looking at your emotional body, through looking at your, your spiritual practice and all these things. The thing is when those when those things get like brahmacharya, when you when you like translate some things, people like things get lost in communication. Yeah. Or lost in translation, shall I say. And that thing of celibacy, it's like um, and you were talking like talk about creativity. You could use the energy to be more creative. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I've talked about masturbation before, um, which um, among men it can seem like a kind of a dirty topic. Sometimes among women it can seem like a, um, a kind of a, a, a joyful topic. Mm -hmm. But as a man, uh, uh, my experience is if you masturbate uh, for the for a bit like anything for the wrong reason, you feel terrible afterwards. I remember one of my friends. Shout out to Adam O'Brien. This is from like <laughs> when we were like fourteen, and he's like, "Do you ever?" Um, I say, I say, I say, is it? Do you ever have a wank and just feel, <laughs> <laughs> and just feel terrible afterwards, really lonely and sad? Mm. And all the lads were like, "No, nah, man, it's great. Everyone's doing it now. We're 14. Uh, <laughs> but you know, fourteen. That's kind of age when you start. Um, some lads do. But I remember thinking, yeah, I do. I, I feel like really sad and lonely and kind of pathetic, and I can't do anything afterwards. Mm. And um, 
your your sexual energy or that um, that you, you have, that fire you have within you can be used to be way, be may, way more creative um, and to choose how you use it as you said mm. it's sex can be wonderful but who is it with when how much are you doing it are you doing it for the right reasons exactly, yeah. um, if it's done in a way that's escaping from something or yeah. you know as an addictive kind of a behavior then you know just looking at that and being like okay well mm. you know maybe that's not the w- wisest use of my energy um yeah so it can mm. be a, this beautiful thing and obviously that's that's how people are still here and it's it's really about looking at um you know the, the these ancient yogis and rishis and stuff that developed these systems like ayurveda and the tantra katha lineage as well um they they developed it so that um let's say householders could do these practices not so that people everyone could go up into caves and meditate for 10 years it, it's like because that's not realistic if you also want to live in the world and have a family and you know engage in community and that kind of thing so really the system that they derived was was directed towards householders and they even say this in the sutras you know um i can't remember the exact quote but it's <coughs> householders is really that was their target and what that means is that in order to have a population that is happy and fulfilled and balanced um these things have to be kind of addressed and it's not to say that you have to meditate every day for 10 years in a cave because that yes that that is that will lead you to some sort of enlightenment i'm sure but it's also kind of um it's also negating the physical body it's mm. it's kind of saying i'm not in this body i'm not here you know mm. it's rejecting it almost mm-hmm. um and a lot of people that i've spoken to and personally as well with my own experience with different eating related issues and stuff i found that that became it, that's really what it comes down to is uh, like not accepting the physical body and so <clears throat> when you get deeper into the the really deep tantric practices and even kundalini it's all about moving energy up and going out into the ether and like having these crazy meditative states and that's great and that is it's an important thing to be able to to get there but to really b- be on the physical plane you also have to be very established in your physical body mm. Um, and have that as a you know be very aware of your body and be very aware of what impacts it and so this is where ayurveda helps as well it's it's coming into that you know the ability to to recognize what sends you a bit out of balance what makes you feel good when you eat it what makes you feel bad what helps with digestion your agni so agni is like the center of all of this i haven't even mentioned that god i should have had a slideshow Um, (laughs) but yeah so it's really about like acknowledging that the physical is just as important as the the kind of spiritual metaphysical kind of side of things Mm. um which again it gets lost sometimes i find people are either very attached to one or the other it's extremes you know especially in the yoga world it's all about the physical or it's all about getting out here and it's Mm. like okay can we meet somewhere in the middle and have an experience of both that's going to lead us to be more empowered and more enlightened at the same time but maybe that more embodied (laughs) yeah maybe jenny that's because sometimes we like to categorize ourselves and each Mm. other to be like you're the athletic type you like doing handstands and that's you Mm. or this is your political views, that's you. Or you look like this, that's you. And we, I think that's actually human nature because mm. we're tribal and we're like, okay, <coughs> I need to figure out quickly, what's this person like? How much can I relate to them? Okay, now cast them aside. Because we only have, for, uh, from an anthropological point of view, I won't go into too much detail on this, yeah. but I'm sure you know this already, but like, you know, like bonobos can only have, I think, 100 110 in their tribe then after that they got split mm. socially they can't do it they have to split um and they will actually uh, no, no a- apes will actually murder each other bonobos won't they're more like humans but anyway the point is you cannot know a thousand people or even uh, like if you've got 20 you cannot know them intimately so therefore you what we do is we cut people off to say like right this is my tribe mm. and i i f- i'm gonna say fuck i fucking <laughs> hate it when people use the word tribe Hey tribe, yeah. my tribe. I like I follow this. I've, I've, I'm subscribed from his emails now, but it's like, um, hey tribe. I'm like, no, my name's Kevin. You know, at least have the decency to put in a mail merge in your Mailchimp and use my first name. I'm not part of your tribe, so I don't know anything about you apart from what you choose to show me on social media. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> so it's just a bit of therapy there. Um, but my point is, it, it's okay if you find yourself making assumptions about someone or and 
Um, but just recognize that we're all doing that about each other and human beings are complex mm. and we have as you said those three elements um that we can we're part we can be all of them and it's to find balance within that mm-hmm. um just to draw back on to talk back on sex again um mm. and this is a point that's come up as you were talking about um like we were saying about why you know why have sex when have it what's the reason and stuff i think shame is a big part of it as well mm. and also sex can be seen as quite dangerous mm. you know we in school we're taught about stds that's what i learned and uh um i remember when i actually to be very personal when i lost my virginity <laughs> i um <clears throat> i actually had to have someone an older uh, like it was my friend's uncle draw a vagina on a napkin for me I was like, this is what it looks oh like. God. I was 17 yeah. and I didn't know really what one looked like. And he was like, and I said, and I kind of said, I've, I've heard like there's two holes in the vagina. I, I was, you know, it's the thing. <laughs> and it, I, where, where do you wee out of? Yeah, oh my gosh. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, no, but it makes sense. 17 years old I was, right? <clears throat> and so he draws it and goes, now it looks kind of, and he was actually really good at sketching, so it was helpful. But he's like, this is what you do. Da, da, da. Yeah. And, um, but to think that I didn't know at 17 about that, went to a Roman Catholic high school. So it was bare minimum. Yeah. And then talking about masturbation, men will call each other wankers. You tosser, you wanker, you jerk off, as is in America. Yeah, <laughs> wanker. That, you wanker. <laughs> um, as an insult. Yeah. You don't hear women say that to each other. Mm, no. You... Oh, <laughs> I don't think... You know... You, yeah. No, I know word. the word. I know, you know the, the word. word. <laughs> you, you just don't say that. But it's, it's just not a nice word. <laughs> you know, it's not a nice word. But we talk about, like, um, your sexuality, and it's great how women have come on leaps and bounds, but it mm. seems like men haven't. We've mm. kind of um, regressed, if anything. We've mm. become more... Pornography is more available now than ever. So it's, it is important whether you're a man or woman listening to this or whoever you identify as to... Um, understand how much shame you have in your sexuality mm. uh, and, yeah, and, 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 and having pleasure. And, um, you know, even, I, like, I, I find getting personal with this, so I understand people, the guests I wanted, but, like, you know, I used to really hate being naked in front of a woman. Hmm. Like, really well. I'd, like, yeah. quickly get out of bed, put my, put my underpants on, you know? Yeah. So it's taken me, like, 38 years, to 38 years now that I'm actually comfortable being completely naked. But obviously that's because I'm a brilliant person, you know, a brilliant yeah. woman. Um, and that's the difference. But um, men's, someone put up on Instagram once, I remember, it was like a picture of a woman in a T-shirt, like a long T-shirt, and a picture of a man in just a long T-shirt with socks on. It's like, one is cute, one is creepy. Yeah, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Imagine a man in just a T-shirt yeah. with socks on. That you know, is a bit much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's, when a woman does it, it's seen as cute. And obviously mm-hmm. the downside of that is women can be objectified as sexual objects and men aren't so much. And that's the other side yeah. of that. But, um, but yeah, se- sex is, I mean, if you have a good sex life... It, it really adds to um, your life. But sometimes as men, you think about it as like, get the job done. Mm. That's it. You have sex, you're done, it's over. Uh, and it's seen as almost like like a function than to have kids maybe. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I suppose it's just not, not talked about enough. Maybe we should start talking about mantra now. Since yeah, no, I, but that's more Jenny Keane's area. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so, like, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. But De- it is in, in Ireland as well. It's, 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 it's an important kind of a pillar, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, why does mantra matter? Ooh. Okay. Um, well, it depends on your understanding of mantra, I feel, first of all. And so just maybe to give a an overview of it. Okay. Um, mantra is... It's a quite a profound practice once you start kind of getting really deep into it. Um, but it's essentially it's a form of meditation, really, um, because the, the even the word mantra mantra is this uh, mind illuminated is what it translates oh, to. Oh, cool. Yeah, and so they say you know you can practice all these asanas and pranayama techniques and this and that and and reach a state of meditation or samadhi or whatever you want. You can do all that, or you can just practice mantra and chant mantra <laughs> and so really what it comes down to is this idea that you know the the universe is created from frequency and different um on a metaphysical level i'm talking now like the vibrational frequency of everything in existence coming down to a cellular level on like an atom an, or not anatomical atom level level mm-hmm. of the atom mm-hmm. i don't know how to say that um atomic level atomic yeah atomic kit Hey. Um, anyway, <laughs> yeah. 
I was listening to a 90s playlist on the way here. <laughs> um, Shout out to Kerry Katona. Basic, right? Yeah, basically, <laughs> um, you know, the, the impact that sound has on our physical bodies is en- enormous. It's the same as like the impact that things like the moon and the, the tides have. So I'm sure you've heard a little bit about that, of the, mm. you know, the level of water in our bodies, something like 70 or 80% or something, yeah. water. And so even just cup on the table, like if I bang that and you see the little ripples, yeah. that same kind of thing is going to happen if I make a very loud noise. You mm. know, that kind of zoom, zoom, mm. zoom, the kind of pulsating yeah. frequency. And so if you think about it on a physical level, I'm just talking physically now, um, that's kind of what's happening in the body when you're when you're chanting and because it's repetitive so um anytime you're chanting mantra or singing in a kirtan it's basically repetitive sanskrit mantras okay so one thing that this does is that the repetition kind of lulls the mind into a state of meditation or a state of easefulness um, and kind of just calms you down and one thing that is involved in this process is the vagus nerve mm-hmm. which i'm sure you've heard about as well it's the you know the, the one of the longest nerves in the body and that it because you're you're using the voice and the vocal cords are quite central to that it's it's vibrating the vagus nerve mm-hmm. so it's l- lulling it again and again so that eventually the mind ends up in this really tranquil really soothing calm state and so that then you drop in the seed of meditation you say to focus on the whatever it is if you're if you're going quite deep into those um, tantric meditations or kriyas that it, it really requires that level of stability in the mind first so that's like the first step and mm. um, what the the sanskrit mantra is really what they do is that these these words are are passed down for centuries and centuries and centuries and so the shakti or the the, the power the energy that they contain like even just saying it it's all it's calling in the energy of everyone who's ever chanted it of all the the groups of the thousands of people who've ever kind of um called that energy in and really bringing that into your existence and holding that in your mind it's even just the intention of that can just transform the way you think and transform the way that you feel in that moment Mm -hmm. um and so there's a lot of things happening you know when you're when you're talking about this and it's it's quite a it's a really special practice like myself and jenny have done a lot of different kirtans now and sometimes you get a group or a room or just the timing you know uh, timing makes a huge difference with things but um i remember around christmas time we were doing them in the fumbly mm. um and it was really cold outside so everyone came and they were all wrapped up in bundles and blankets and we had candles everywhere and it just was this magical experience where everyone was just singing it does it, like it didn't matter what what they it sounded like it was because that's the thing you know you don't have to be a singer to to do this Mm -hmm. um i've just kind of found found my way into it from being in a band and from being musical my whole life that Mm -hmm. as soon as yoga came into my life and i found mantra i was like oh okay this this is this is me this is for me yeah you know Mm -hmm. um so it really just touched me very very deeply um and I, i was very lucky to practice and learn from a lot of um incredible um kirtan singers in in bali like my friend ellen arthur she's absolutely divine um she chants in the practice in bali i'm sure you've you've been there yeah yeah Yeah, so ellen is ellen is just magical and i've learned a lot from her um and then just from going to different kirtan circles and sessions and listening myself and then trying to play them again um it just really added to my own yoga practice you know and especially on days where you're feeling a little bit scattered or the vata is a little bit high you're kind of like what like because mantra and meditation are some of the best tools for vata imbalances to really Mm. focus and calm the mind um and so that has really helped me as well with with that and just being able to know that again has been like okay this is what i need right now um and then also the community that it creates because when you bring people like that together in in a circle to sing regardless of who they are their background where they've come from like it doesn't matter it's Mm. it just comes back down to their voices and people this idea of that everybody just wants to be heard everyone just wants a space to express um and that's where the magic kind of really comes out because there's no there's no judgment there's no like let's sing this note and that's not it's not a choir sometimes it ends up sounding like one but that's totally just by chance you know if if depending on the group that's there it's just like just sing whatever you want um and the freedom of that you know especially coming from 
like I said, I have a musical background and I've always been in orchestras and bands and different things my whole life. And so that was very focused on, you know, playing the right note and singing the right note and having to be perfectly in tune all the time. And I ended up becoming very, very hard on myself if I ever didn't do it right. You know, if I'd make mistakes or sang something wrong, I'd be like, oh God, I'm terrible. This isn't, you know, so that kind of takes away from the enjoyment of it. Um, it takes away from you being in the moment. It takes away from the benefits of it, basically. Um, and so with with this, to be told, you know, doesn't matter what you sound like, just sing. It's like, ah, okay. And then, mm. you know, it, it ends up, it ends up, sounding amazing anyway because you're just you're just expressing and it's so honest and authentic and um yeah it's it's magical it really really is um and so i hope i answered that you asked the purpose of mantra a lot of people say (laughs) great answer a lot of people say i can't sing Mm. instead of i don't sing um and i used to go and watch arsenal play in the in highbury uh, which is now the emirates (laughs) <laughs> and uh, when I was a, a lad and when you go and chant in a football game mm. now now, fair enough sometimes you're saying rude words about someone's mother or something like that right but so some of this content isn't always the, the, the most family friendly but the experience of chanting in a group is spiritual yeah. uh, some of the songs like um, even the Liverpool anthem Walk On you'll never walk alone mm. you know that's a beautiful song i heard two lads on their on bicycles the other day uh, actually just last night cycling along the road singing that singing that with each other and i'm like that is a beautiful song if you listen to someone who's a really lovely singer that sing that it'll bring a tear to your eye <laughs> goosebumps when you said that about the two lads just yeah. i love that i love two lads. they're like that. 14 years old I and love that. um you know you know you'll never walk alone and uh when you've got eighty thousand people singing that you have got to be made of stone if you're not moved. Yeah. And um, so I, 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 it can be very powerful. And mm. it does, without sounding corny, but bring everyone on a similar vibration. It does. <laughs> it does. No, it, yeah, that's it does. exactly what it does. It just yeah. it brings everyone together on that level as yeah, well. You exactly. Know? Um, yeah, exactly. It does something to you, 100%. And yeah, look, when I used to work with choirs with um, TG Lurgan, with the Gaeltacht, um work that I used to do, and my job was always the choir you know and so it's almost like my previous experiences doing all of that stuff have led to this kind of mantra work which Mm -hmm. is really interesting for me to consider because I always was drawn to harmony Mm -hmm. I was drawn to you know how can I how can I make you know really cool harmonies happen in this group and this choir group and for me it was always about that it was always just about oh let's let's put as many layers to this as we can and like try and just get you know really tap into that harmonious side of things even though I didn't really know that's what I wanted you know it would only come about then when everyone was singing and it would be like all the kids would be like in harmony these are kids that are not musicians Mm -hmm. I would just be like guys sing this note guys you guys sing this note and then let's put it together and it would just be like Mm boo all of like that feeling of like your cells vibrating almost of like the harmony that it happens yeah um and when it comes down to it yoga is union you know two things coming together Mm -hmm. and fitting and so to me, that's what it really is. It's that harmony of mind and body, of body and movement, breath and movement, whatever you want to consider it as, but it's harmony, yeah. you know? And so there's this thing, I ha- remember. I can't remember who wrote it, but it was something about the different types of souls that um, we are and that we in- are incarnate as or whatever. And one of them was a harmonizer soul. And the purpose of a harmonizer soul was to bring people back into balance and bring back bring people back into harmony with themselves and with nature mm. and you know the hum- humanity with with nature basically and that's kind of what we're seeing now i feel with everything that's going on is this, this massive r- shifting of something mm. um it's hard to tell exactly what it is but to me it's it's kind of something shifting so that it can go back into alignment mm-hmm. and so even the teachings of ayurveda really align with this as well because it's all about returning to balance mm. and returning to that harmony um, in your body and in your mind and so like it's all it's just all different ways of doing mm. the same thing really but for me mantra was like the most impactful thing that i've done really listen to how i'm going to segue to the next bit mm. speaking of harmony mm. jenny <laughs> <laughs> should we finish with a song sure now what am i doing oh i have, am I just, like tapping the table i have something? an egg shaker go on then yeah will i get it where is it it's just in my bag yeah yeah get it okay uh, yeah go on <laughs> 
I'll just hold the fort. So Jenny's trying not to lock the lights over. She's going to get me an egg shaker. Which I'm sure is full of like sand or something. There we go. This I'm re relegated or maybe promoted to an egg shaker. All right, cool. <coughs> so right. I can do a mantra or a song. What kind of beat? I suppose I'll just pick it up. I yeah. mean, will I be messing this up now? Uh, what? Maybe like that kind of at tempo? the end. Okay, I got yeah, you. I'll I got give you a you. nod. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I could do mantra or oh, the, the rice, the rice is the rice. Okay, yeah. So I mean, I Jenny wrote this herself. She might be too sh shy to say. So this is is that right? Can I give right? an example of mantra as well? Oh yeah, go on then. Yeah, just a short one. Um, so no egg shaker for the mantra or egg shaker for the mantra. I'll see. We'll just flow. Flow. We go flow it. <laughs> um. <clears throat> okay, so this is one. <clears throat> it's to the goddess Lakshmi um, and so when we speak about the god gods and goddesses during this it's really what they represent and that kind of intention behind it as well which is really important because I know sometimes that kind of language can throw people off a bit especially in a country like Ireland where all kinds of spirituality is a little bit um, I don't know there's just a different kind of perception of it yeah. um, but Lakshmi in this tradition represents abundance, so in all kind of sorts. Um, and to me as well, that that really talks to this idea of, you know, the fact that we sometimes live from a place of lack and we're kind of coming from this lack mentality of there's never going to be enough and I'm never going to be have or be enough. And um, But realising that we do, we have access to that abundance if we just kind of really aligned ourselves towards it instead of focusing on the lack let's say mm -hmm. um and so that's kind of an idea of, of what she represents but also to realize what we already do have as well um in terms of abundance um of all kinds <coughs> so we'll just do a few rounds um but the words are om lakshmi om and then lakshmi maha devi so generally with kirtan we do call and response but you don't have to i'll do it <laughs> yeah? yeah yeah of course Om Lakshmi Om Lakshmi Om Not just me. No. <laughs> I can't. It's just me. Go on. Okay. <laughs> Not after that.
<laughs> that's so jelly. Thank you. Wow. wow, that's good. Um, so yeah, generally like it starts kind of call and response with the group. And yeah, then <laughs> with I, the group. I didn't prepare yeah. you. I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, and then sometimes it just kind of takes off and everyone sings whatever you know. Yeah. So it's the first couple of rounds I like that. Um, but yeah, it's it's a really nice experience mm. to do it with a group. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll do rise now. Yeah. Okay, so this is one of my own songs, so it's less of the mantra kind of style of things, but mm. it's also, it's just something, I wrote it like over a year ago now, I'd say, but it was, um, <clears throat> it was kind of just in response to this feeling of, you know, needing to step into myself as a, as a woman, as a, as a human being, really, and like to step up into uh, um, my potential, I suppose. Um, and I felt like a lot of people I was speaking to, friends and that at the time in the yoga kind of scene were experiencing kind of similar things and that they were like, I know I can do this, but I'm afraid or I know I have potential, but I don't really know what to do next kind of thing. Um, so it's really about moving into that space, like owning that kind of as a as a person. Okay. As a woman, as so, well. Sounds good. <clears throat> so you can maybe come in at the end. I'll I'll, I'll signal you for this because it gets a bit faster. <laughs> <clears throat> Sister, rise. You've 
Jenny. Thank you. That was so good. For your wow. shaker skills. Thank you. I'll try. Jenny, phenomenal. If people want to find you, mm. what's your home address? I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, how Send me it? free things. <laughs> yeah. How do people get in touch with you? Um, I have Instagram. It's Jenny Bean 108 like mm. Jelly Bean, but with Jenny. Oh. And um, I have nurtureyournatureyoga.com as well. So I'm... I'm currently um, promoting a an Ayurvedic course four weeks in end of July, beginning of August. So all of August basically, mm. um, where we'll just be doing some online workshops, and then everyone who takes part will also get one to one attention about the Ayurveda side of things as well. Of you know how what practices to suit them and different things like this. So that's um, my thing at the moment. And I also have I don't know when this is going to air, but I have a workshop tomorrow. <laughs> I oh, know. Okay. No she, you had a workshop 10 days ago. <laughs> okay, great. No worries. Um, yeah, and then hopefully we get some Kirtan this dates. Is gonna, sorry, going. this is going to be out in the uh, middle of July. Okay, cool. Okay, so it's perfect timing for the, the program then, because that's 27th. Sweet. Um, but hopefully we will get some Kirtan dates for Dublin soon, myself mm. and Jenny Keane. Um, don't know where they'll be just yet, but hopefully when things get back to some semblance of normality, we can come together and sing in a group it would Great. be lovely to Brilliant. have 